Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another DigitalOcean Tech Talk. I am happy to be here today. It is a wonderful, wonderful day. I, it's nice and cool here in Texas today. I enjoy, I enjoy the cool weather. Um, not the cold weather that I've had recently, but the cool weather I can deal with. Um, and today, my tech talk, we will be talking about SSL, um, keeping your sites and users safe using uh, SSL. And we're going to talk today about all things SSL from, we're going to talk about like what SSL is. I, why, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I have slides for this. Hello, my name is Mason Egger. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Mason Egger if you ever want to hear the random things that come out of my head. Um, or you can read my blog. Those are even more random than the things that come out on Twitter, but they're usually pretty interesting and entertaining. So the goals of today's tech talk, we are going to talk about SSL and TLS. Um, if you've never heard of it before, it's going to be a great place to begin to learn about what it is. If you haven't uh, heard, if you have heard about it before, be a nice refresher. Hi, Frank. Hi, everyone. How's everyone in the chat doing today? See, Alexander, we've got Cruz, Frank, uh, Beethoven, as so, Vanessa, uh, where's everyone joining us from? How's, how's it going today? So I want to say hi to Frank. Hi, Frank. And then, hello, everyone. Hello, Alexander. Oh, hi, Vanessa. And Benjamin. It's good to see everyone here saying hello this morning. And people coming in from all over the place. We have someone from Walter who's here from Africa. Wow, that's, that's amazing. I'm always really happy to see people from all over the place. Wow. That's so cool. I, I love how I love it, it, this is just so much fun. I really enjoy talking to people from all over the place. It's super cool. And here come in all the fantastic. Okay. Well, continuing onward. Uh, good morning to everyone. It's great to see all of y'all here. Uh, so we're going to be doing SSL today. I'm going to talk about introduce you to SSL. We're going to talk about SS, how SSL works. We're actually going to get into um, a little bit of the nitty gritty of SSL. Like how does the TLS handshake happen? Um, and all of that, then we're going to do some demos. I'm going to show you just a whole, a whole plethora of really tiny demos, um, doing SSL stuff. So we're going to demo CertBot you on Apache and Nginx. I'm going to demo Caddy, which if you've never heard of Caddy, it's a new, it's a newer, more kind of modern web browser that, um, that does SSL by default, which is really awesome. I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, SSL termination and load balancers, especially how you can do as uh, we, you can do it. And yes, we already have the first comment TLS over SSL. Yes, we're going to cover that. It is TLS over SSL. Um, <laughs> we've already got the first comment on that. And we're three minutes in. I have a bet with someone in the company about when I was going to see that first comment. So Jimmy, thank you for that. I think I just won the bet. Um, so someone now owes me a Coke. Um, so yes, it is TLS over SSL, and we are going to cover that. But since SSL is the more common term, and it's the term that kind of like permeated through the space, it's still referred to SSL, even though most people don't use native SSL anymore. It is done through TLS. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So what is SSL TLS? So let's just start with some definitions. SSL stands for Secure Sockets Layer. And essentially, this is a technology that was used for keeping the internet secure. Um, it's an encryption software. It use, you, you've, you, you've used it. Even if you don't know what it is, everyone in this chat has used TLS or SSL in some way, shape, or form. So, and I'm going to show you in a minute. So, when we go to what the other one is, TLS, this stands for Transport Layer Security. Um, this is an updated, more secure version of SSL. So SSL was the original software that was used to kind of keep everything secure, kind of keep everything, you know, happy and going. But then, you know, with vulnerabilities and modern technology, TLS came out. And even though the libraries are still known as like OpenSSL, LibreSSL, they do use TLS on the back end. So um, we will refer to our CL, our certificates today as SSL certs. Um, due to them being a more being a more common term, however, uh, when you get a certificate now, it is a TLS certificate. So this is just one of those instances where, like, while the technology has evolved, the terminology itself, like, it just became synonymous. SSL means you know security HTTPS, and even though the technology changed and we have a different phrase for it now, it's used the same. This does happen quite a bit in tech. Um, 
So, and unfortunately, I can't think of anything right now. I know there's examples. They're in my head, but they're not coming out right now. So um, if you have any examples of that, please drop them in the chat. Man, we have everyone coming in today. We have people from Portugal, Arizona, more Portugal, Morocco, Spain. Man, everyone is just all over the world. This is amazing. Yes, this. someone's asking, will this be available later in the channel? Yes, all of our tech talks are always available on YouTube after the fact, so you're welcome to come and listen to me ramble as many times as you want. You know, this, 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 you can listen to the Southern Texas draw as much as you want. So here we go. The another, another terminology that we're going to use a lot today is HTTPS. So this is where if you haven't used SSL before in the past, or you don't know if you have, this is where you've used it. Hypertext transfer protocol secure because HTTP stands for hypertext transfer protocol. And it was, you know, data was transmitted across the wire in an insecure way. And then we realized that we need to actually encrypt our data to prevent malicious things, people stealing data, people manipulating the data and all of that. So now we have HTTPS. So basically we encrypt our site's traffic now so prying eyes can't sniff it. Um, and you've seen this before, that little lock icon in your browser. If you're on YouTube right now or Facebook or anything and you look up in your browser bar, you'll see like a little lock. It may be green depending on the website that is hosting it. They used to be green. Now they're not, some of them are not green anymore. But there's a little lock there. And if you click on your URL and you get the full URL, you'll see HTTPS. That is what SSL and TLS provides for us. It provides us this safe and secure um, browsing experience. So, well, what packages do we use for this? So how does how do how do we use this? Well, it's usually just done on the browser level, but there are two. There's actually quite a few different SSL TLS packages, but we're going to talk about the two main ones that I'm that I'm familiar with. So the one that most people are familiar with is OpenSSL. Um, this is the default provider for millions of sites, hundreds of millions of sites. Probably, I would almost say billions. I'm curious. I would say probably billions of sites use OpenSSL. It's the default in most of your providers. Um, and if you're not actively trying to use it, this is what you are actually using. Um, it is also a general purpose cryptography library. You don't just have to use OpenSSL for like TLS and HTTPS certificates. It supports all different types of cipher suites um, and all different types of just encryption algorithms and all of that stuff. So it's used as a general purpose encryption library, um, but it's called OpenSSL. It is maintained by the OpenSSL project. It is actually... There's an entire governing board, an entire set of developers that are sole for focus, sole's focus is to work on the OpenSSL project. It is the default um, package on almost all Unix-like operating systems. So Linux, Mac OS, yes, Mac OS is a Unix-like operating system. Uh, bonus points to the person in the chat who can tell me what Unix-like operating system uh, Mac OS is based off of. Because it is, and if we don't get we don't get any answers in the chat, I will answer that in a little bit. It's one of my favorite little pieces of trivia, um, and then of course Microsoft Windows. So uh, the other package that we have is Libre SSL. So Libre SSL is actually a fork of Open SSL, and this fork is maintained by the OpenBSD community. So the OpenBSD community basically forked this in 2014 because of the Heartbleed vulnerability. So um, yes, we've got, we're getting some answers. Sweet. Um, so yes, the Heartbleed vulnerability was a very nasty, um, open SSL bug that basically happened in 2014. I was in college when this happened. I was, I was still like, I was still studying computer science at the time. And it was really interesting to be a university student at the time that this, and I was actually taking my security class at that time. Um, so to be taking a securities class, with the professor when probably one of the worst vulnerabilities that has plagued the internet came out because instantly most um, most HTTPS sites were vulnerable to this attack. So Libre SSL um, was, uh, was made and it was basically like, we're going to fix it because in reality, while the, while the bug in open SSL was, 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 was bad, it actually was caused by a faulty return statement. It was like there was this return. If I remember correctly, there was this return statement that short circuited a, a, one of the cryptography functions or one of the buffer overflow functions, something like that. Something it's it's always with memory. When anything's written in C, ninety five percent of your bugs are buffer overflow. Um, and this there was a single line. It had been there for decades. It was not like this. Like no one cracked the algorithm 
and you know decrypted rsa even though that's been done or any of these no it was a fault in a simple if statement logic that left everyone vulnerable and the libre ssl people and if you don't know the open bsd community it's a community that prides itself on security so um that's why open ssh is actually maintained by them as well and that's why it's one of the most secure tools there is um so they forked it and now it is the default package on OpenBSD, Dragonfly BSD. If you've never played with it, it's actually kind of cool. And TrueOS. TrueOS, if you are not, um, if you're not familiar with it, it's the old PC BSD. I used to be really into the BSDs. I have a YouTube series on my personal YouTube channel where I talk about BSD a lot. Um, I did like 25 episodes of this of the show called BSD Synergy. Um, so I'm that's why I really like it. And we're gonna go over here and look at these. Um, at these uh chats so yes people are getting it right the the unix like system that um that now that mac os is a derivative of is actually free bsd so if I, and if I remember correctly it's free bsd 4.3 so it is called darwin when you open up your mac terminal you see darwin and you also if you dig deep enough down you will find next os so i'm seeing all the correct answers so mac now is known as darwin next os was actually a operating system that was a fork of FreeBSD that was created at the next project, which was led by Steve Jobs after he left, or the company was, he didn't do the engineering. Um, but when he left Apple, he founded Next. And when he came back to Apple in like the, the early Renaissance, when he, when he was brought back, whenever Apple was like nearly failing in the early nineties um, and he came back, uh, he brought Next with him. So, and then Next became the heart of OS X. And since Next was based off of FreeBSD, um, then yes, it is, uh, and sorry, yes, and then that's what happened. So I'm looking at some questions in the chat. In the chat, uh, is there a way to upload its own TLS surf into the app's platform special wildcard certificate? Um, you know, currently no. If this, if you're talking about app platform, I do not believe we have this functionality yet. But if this is a feature that you would like, I will happily take this back to the product team and I will let them know that people are asking for this. Um, Clifford says, wow, a little line. Yes, it was. I remember, I remember like reading about this and like we we studied it, and it was it was a single line. It was a single misplaced return statement that caused the heart bleed bug. Um, is OpenSSL really secure? It is secure. Like they have done a lot more. This actually on a on an entirely different level, this this brought about the need for audit and open source. So the open source communities, while while very popular, like have been popular for a very long time, if I like the large companies weren't as invested in open source in the early 2010s. Like nowadays, when you look at like Google and like Facebook, like they all have these open source divisions and stuff. If I remember correctly, and I could be wrong, they weren't as invested as they are now. Like they've gotten really into it. And one of the biggest things that was the catalyst for this was this bug. Um, there was a lot of discussion about auditing of packages why was no one auditing this and it, the, the, the open SSL community was like we're doing the best we can with all of the free labor we can if you want more secure so like you need to help us with this and i do believe if i remember like this kind of spurred like and started some of the more um some of the more uh companies taking a big step into open source because i remember like i remember when microsoft used to bash linux and stuff and used to say that it was not you know, like the open source was, was, I remember Steve Ballmer saying open source was a cancer or Linux was a cancer on, on, the, on the software community. And then now you look at Microsoft today and like, you would never know that they had that like the kind of mentality. Like they're so into the open source. Now Microsoft employs Guido Van Rossum, the creator of Python, just to write Python. Like they, they fund Google hired recently hired a, um, they have this, they're, they're hiring a, a core C Python developer. I'm very big in the Python community, so I know what's going on in the Python community. Um, but they hired a, a, a core Python developer. They're paying them a software engineer's jo salary just to work on Python. They're doing nothing for Google. They're just working on Python. So we've seen this shift, and I really do believe that the Heartbleed bug was a big part in this because the, the big companies realized that so much of their technology was built off of the goodwill of others, and they realized that they need to start going into it a little bit more. So um, that was a tangent that I did not think I was going to go down. So that's how we know that these are always just, these tech talks always go in many different directions. So, uh, but yes. So why do you need SSL TLS? 
um, you need to create a safer experience for your with your users for your users. Like it creates uh, that should say for. Um, it allows your users to have confidence in you. Like like your users, I enter in my bank information because I want to do my online banking. It's secure. I don't have to worry about my credentials being leaked out because we're using the software. It protects their data and privacy by encrypting the data. So that, you know, it helps me with that. Uh, verifies the identity of websites from fraudulent looking websites. TLS does do like, ver like whenever a certificate authority issues, issues you a certificate, it's basically saying, we think that this person is who they say they are. Um, so you can trust them. If you try to impersonate a website and they're using HTTPS and you try to do that, that exchange, it's going to fail. And it's going to be like, Hey, this is not the actual website you think it is. So it gives us uh, some sort of identity, identity verification. Um, it allows us to build trust with your users. You know, you're, you, you're, you know, you're protecting my data. Okay. You care about me a little bit. I will trust you. Um, it allows you to avoid warnings from your browsers. And if you've, if you've ever tried to go to a regular just HTTP site, your browsers, like I know like Firefox now just absolutely complains. Like Firefox 83 plus will manually prompt you and will not let you go to an HTTP site without like you having to do it now. Like they've gotten really, they've gotten really good there. Um, and this is really interesting because again, I remember when most of the website was insecure and most of the website of the, of the web was HTTP. Um, and we're going to talk about why that shifted in the next slide. Um, modern browsers actually now are forcing HTTP. So like, or HTTPS, if you try to type in HTTP, it will force an HTTPS connection if it can. Um, so like now the browsers are saying, no, you must browse securely, which is pretty nice. It's a little bit odd, but it's nice. Um, it also, and this is a big one for a lot of business owners. Come on. Am I back? I think I'm back. Uh, yeah. If I'm back, magic person in the sky, send me a message in private chat. Um, or thumbs up, my back. Good. Okay, good. So that was... Ah, sorry about that. That happens sometimes with my internet provider. Um, good. Sorry. That happens. Anyway, uh, higher, higher SEO with Google. Um, before HTTPS was like very, very common, and I'm so happy that I can say that it's common now. Like I don't go to websites that are HTTP anymore in 2021. The same could not be said for 2013, even 2016, 2017. There were still a good amount of HTTP only sites. Um, so S Google will SEO you hire now. I think that was actually one of the big ones is a lot of people who are making businesses and stuff. SEO is very important. I'm, I, I, I'm a software engineer, but at, at DigitalOcean, I'm a developer advocate and I'm a, uh, I'm a, um, I work in marketing. And I'm learning about all of these marketing things that I've never known about. And I did not realize how important SEO was until I started working in marketing. So um, it, it is beyond important. So the fact that you get anything to get you one more check mark in the Google likes me and SEO box, especially something that's easy and is now free to do, you should do it. So how does it work? Okay. How does SSL and TLS work? This is going to be a little bit technical, and but it's still also going to be high level. Like I'm not going to dive into the SSL code, but we're going to talk a little bit, a bit about the protocols. And don't worry if this if this bores you, twiddle your thumbs for a little bit, and we're going to get to demos in about five minutes. Um, so it begins with the TLS handshake, which I'm going to go over in the next slide, to exchange keys. So basically, the client and the server exchange keys with each other to create a secure uh, thing. RSA is the most common algorithm that is used. It's the default, um, but others can be used. You can totally use like a Diffie-Hellman type algorithm if you really wanted to. Um, but right now, currently, like default is RSA, and that's what most people use. I think it's RSA 2096 bits. Um, I personally like, or 2048, sorry. I like 4096, uh, and I know some people are even going to 8192, but 2048 is still deemed secure. Um, there will become a point in time when 20, when 2048 will not be secure anymore. Um, and we'll have to move to 4096, but that's, that's mostly just as computers get more powerful, cracking these algorithms becomes easier because RSA has been, um, has been cracked if I remember correctly. So, um, 
during handshake session keys are generated uh, to encrypt and, and decrypt data. So basically they each get a key and they can send data to each other. Um, especially if you're doing symmetric encryption, uh, different keys are used each session. So every time I start a new, um, a new session with the website, like I go to Facebook again for another time, I'm going to get a different key. Um, TLS verifies the identity of the server um, through a certificate authority and the use of public private keys. So basically if I try to go to Facebook and it, it does not, um, and I'm not Facebook, uh, it will let me know. It will let me know and my browser will like, ah, and it will be very upset with me. Um, TLS ensures that you that data also has not been altered because it uses what's known as a message authentication code as a Mac included in the transmission, which I looked it up a little bit. This kind of reminds me of kind of like a SHA in a way, but I think it's a little bit less complex than uh, a hash, um, SHA like SHA-256. I don't think that's the exact algorithm they use, um, but it kind of has this way of saying this message is this message is not only um, not only from the user you think it's from, but this message is also the message that they sent because you could, you know, in theory, inject stuff in the middle and change the message if you're really, really good at it. But the Mac should be able to, you know, prevent some of the stuff. So the TLS handshake this is actually really fun. I like cryptography. I like how clients and servers do stuff. I can't do the math behind this, but I do love talking about cryptography. So basically what happens is the first thing that happens is the client will say hello with the TLS version, the cipher suites that it supports and a random bytes set of bytes known as the client random and it sends this data to the server. The server will reply with its own certificate, basically it's public key and it's a, and basically the server's choosing cipher, choosing cipher. So the client will send send stuff over and the server's like of these I want to use this one. Um and it's going to say that and then it sends another set of bytes over known as the server random. The client verifies the server's certs from the certificate authority making sure this actually is who they say they are confirming its identity, and then if it works, it will proceed. The client then sends another random set of bytes known as what's known as the pre-master secret, um, which is encrypted with the public key of the server. So it sends, it creates this, this secret and it encrypts it with the public key of the server. The only person who could decrypt this secret would be the server because it is the one with the private key. Um, if a real just brief intro on public private key encryption, one key unlocks the other. So if I encrypt something with a my private key, and I send it out into the world, anyone with my public key could decrypt it. This verifies my identity. Only I hold the private key, but the public key is held by everyone. But if I, if someone encrypts something with my public key, so like, again, public key is public. I can go, Mason's public key is right here. I'm going to encrypt a message with him. The only person who could decrypt that message is me because I'm the one with the private key. So you could write me a secret message and send it to me and only I would be able to open it. So that's what the client is doing here. The client is saying, hey, I know the, the server's public key. I'm going to take it. And I'm going to write a little secret message on it. And I'm going to send it back to the server. Only the server will be able to do that. And then once the server has it, both the client and the server have this secret. And then what they can do there is they will do, the server will decrypt the secret and then they can use those three, ran, those three randoms. So the client random, the server random, these technically could have been exposed over the public. Like these could be known, but that third secret is really secret. And what they do is they take these three things and they generate a secret because only the client knows that third one and they will come out to the same. And then basically the client says, okay, I know what this is. The server says, I know what this is. And now we have achieved, achieved encryption because now we have a, a basically an encryption, I guess a key, a key made of three other randoms that are now used to establish these connections and only the client and the server know it. And in my mind, this is really elegant. Like, I think this is a beautiful way of doing things. It makes me really happy. Um, but, and that's the TLS handshake. And this is a TLS handshake, I must say, with an RSA key. If you're using like a Diffie-Hellman algorithm, it will be different. Um, because this is what is how it's done with, um, RSA is asymmetric keys. So if you're using a symmetric key algorithm, um, then it would be different. If you have no idea what I just said, don't worry about it. You're going to be using RSA because you're probably going to use the default. So it's no big deal. This is just me kind of like, I like talking about this stuff. So I wanted to talk about it and it kind of pads a little bit. So I have time for my demos. So let's talk about let's encrypt and start bot. This is, I believe the last slide before I get to the demos, but if I'm a liar, you can call me a liar in a little bit. So certificates used to be expensive. I remember Never, I never did it because I never could afford $150 for a certificate when I was a poor college student. Um, but 
I'm looking at the chat real quick. Okay, I'll go over that in a second. So certificates used to be expensive. And it used to be only run by uh, commercial authorities. Like basically, a you would pay a commercial authority, you would generate your own key, and then you would upload it to them. They would sign it and say, yes, I know who you are. It actually used to be a process. You used to have to upload like identity, like, like your driver's license. And like, now I know who you are. Excuse me. And it was a big process and it cost a lot of money. Um, it charged for verification and signing of certificates. But then Let's Encrypt came out. So Let's Encrypt is an open and automated um, certificate authority. So Let's Encrypt basically uh, uses a really cool tool called ACME or the Automated Certificate Management Environment to provide TLS and SSL certificates for free. So before Let's Encrypt, um, it, you had to pay for it. And that's why most of your sites were insecure. In the in the 90s, in the early 2000s, in the early, what do we call it, the aughts? The early 2000s, the, the aught, you know, it's aught two, aught three. Um, and then the early, and then like the, even the early 10s, the early teens, I don't know, 10s, um, certificates were, were expensive. And that's why a lot of your traffic wasn't encrypted. Now that it's become free and Let's Encrypt does this for everyone, um, that's why most of the traffic is encrypted now because most people don't pay for it. I do believe, if I remember correctly, on last time I looked, which was a long time ago, more than two thirds of the internet's traffic was being served by Let's Encrypt, the Let's Encrypt Certificate Authority. Very few people um, actually pay for certificates anymore. Now, I don't even, I, there is an extra layer of like, if you want to have your ver identity like verified, verified, maybe you do it. Maybe large companies do it. I've never used anything other than Let's Encrypt and I've worked for Fortune 500 companies. So, I don't know. Um, maybe some people still do that. So what we got out of Let's Encrypt was CertBot. So CertBot is actually the most popular Let's Encrypt client. There are, I, I've heard there are other clients. I've never tried it. But CertBot basically um, automates the creation, the signing the, of the certificates. But then they added a little bit of extra flair to it. And it will modify your, web, your running web servers to use them. So you'll like, it will just, you just run the command. And it works and you get a certificate and you're done. And it's amazing. So now we're going to move forward. Before we move forward, I'm going to answer some questions from chat because I'm definitely seeing some stuff. Uh, wow, that's a lot of questions. I'm going to answer Frank. Frank, I see your question on Facebook. I'm going to, okay, let's just, let's just go with it. It's a lot, but we can, we'll answer these questions real quick before I get into the demos. So question one, how does the load balancer handle multiple small site assets over SSL? Does performance take a hit? Um, encryption is, encryption and decryption is expensive. So it is likely that you will take a performance hit, but most of your modern loan balancers are designed to do this. So it would be a little bit less of a performance hit. It's kind of a hard one to know. I'd actually have to do some testing to see that. Um, but it, what you may do is say you have a lot of small sites. Um, and there's a lot of options here. You could do you could do subject alternate names where you could just use one cert for every site behind it. So that way it's not having to like go through all the different ones. Um, that, I don't know if that's really necessarily the greatest idea. You could... Um, use a wildcard certificate if they're all in the same domain, but if they're different subdomains, you might not want to do that. Um, or if it's different domains, you might not want, you can't do a wildcard cert, but if they're all the same domain, but they're different subdomains, you could use a wildcard cert. I know large organizations definitely use wildcard certs. Um, I used to work at, I was a student worker at Texas State University and I, I, I managed, I helped work with their wildcard certs. So I remember that. Um, so there's a lot of options for that. The, any large amount of encryption will be a performance hit, but it's it's a hit you have to take. Like you you have to keep your users secure, so you just kind of deal with it. Um, and there's lots of ways of optimizing around it. Not none like the things I just mentioned. Two, how about 404 errors like missing assets? Do they pose a problem? No, no, it doesn't matter. The 404 doesn't have anything to do with the certificate. The 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 certificate protects the whole site and everything underneath it. It's not like a site per asset. So it's not like there's a certificate for masonegger.com slash happypuppies.png and a different certificate for masonegger.com slash happykitties.png. There's a certificate for masonegger.com or mason.dev. I, I use both. Um, and there might be a different certificate for test.mason.dev, but there's not like so it's only one certificate. But if I was doing like test.mason.dev, test two, test three, test four, it might be wiser for me to use a wildcard certificate at that point. 
Um, three, what's the limitation of the number of certificates that can be used per subdomains? You really only need one per subdomain. Um, and if you're using a wildcard cert, you need one for a lot of subdomains. Um, if you run, if it's subdomains, you could just use a wildcard certificate. Do you pl pl contribute to Brotley? I don't know what Brotley is. Um, is it required to use wildcards for, yes, you can use OpenSL for wildcard domains, 100%. So there was a lot of questions, but I got through them, so I'm happy. Um, next question. Do, 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 uh, why does okay FF allows security exceptions configurable each side of is, is common and is this common and welcome practice? Um, only do security exceptions on sites that you know and trust. Like if it's your personal site, you you could do a security exception on it, but um, you don't want to uh. Like, don't just do it for anything and everything. And even then, security exceptions might expose you to, like, HTTP could expose you to man-in-the-middle attacks. It could expose you to injection attacks. Um, so you don't want to, like, you don't want to be doing these. Just secure your site. Uh, why does certificates expire? Um, to make sure that the entity that wants them still is still valid, that they're still there. Like, someone could take over. There could be something malicious. It could not be the same person anymore. You don't want like the identity could, of the of the user could change, um. So you want them to be able to expire. And also, um, the longer the longer a certificate stays in the in the wild, the more likely it, it could potentially be cracked. Someone has more time to work on it. So you want to rotate these, kind of like you rotate your passwords. You kind of want to rotate your certificates. Um, I do believe that Let's Encrypt Insert Bot, the ninety day thing is a little bit excessive. I don't think you need to rotate your certificates every ninety days, but that's what they do. So that's what we get with stuck with. Um, what is the main difference between free and paid SSL certificates? Um, probably support. You could probably get better support from it. Um, also, it you the, the certificate authority used to like, I mean, it still matters. Like certain certificate authorities have a different um have different rankings. Like this one's better than like this one's more trusted than this one. Ver Veris Verisert. I don't remember the old one anymore. Um that, that name's familiar. Um, you used to do that, and like some certificate authorities can have their um you could they could in theory have their like trust revoked um so the difference between paid is like when you pay for it you're you're banking on someone else's reputation um i will say that the let's encrypt cert bot certificates for everyone does pose a problem because you know with the free and paid the older stuff um or with the paid with the paid ssl certs there was a level of verification behind that like you knew that that was like legit now anyone who's creating malware could easily get a certain use it. So it's kind of, we've opened Pandora's box a little bit. Now that we let everyone get it, we have secured the web, but now the malicious people can also secure the web. So it's it's really a, it's a, it's a Pandora's box kind of thing. It's really interesting. Um, there have been issues with Let's Encrypt renewals though. I get, you know, every now and then I deal with that. Um, I just run it and it works. So every certificate thing has had renewal though. Um, there's actually we're gonna actually talk about this. Um, I've always wondered if my crons are off. There's actually a certbot.timer now. Like it's in the system. Like we're gonna I'm gonna show you in Ubuntu. It's really cool. I just saw it. Like I've never seen this before. Uh do, 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 do. trust that came along, yeah. Uh do, do, do. man, there are a lot of questions. Remember the um Verisign, that's what it's called. Uh, question, how worried should I be about SL, GZIP vulnerability? I actually don't know. I don't know. What you're. I, unfortunately, I don't know if there's been something with GZIP lately. Um, you should always be worried about vulnerability. You should always be doing an audit of your security stuff. You should always be You should always be aware and alert. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I'll let the people in the chat answer that. Doo -doo -doo. Uh, you know what? This is a good question, and I did not even think to put this in this presentation. So what is a certificate chain? So long story short, you it may not just be one certificate. There could be what's known as the top level certificate and intermediate and then another. Um, and then like the actual certificate for the site. And you can use the intermediate to generate them. And if you need to, like you could use multiple intermediates, like multiple intermediates. And then like if everything in that intermediate gets gets compromised, you just redo the intermediate. So that way you don't have to reintroduce the top level. Um, so that way... It's, it's a way of mitigating risk because like, say you have a top level certificate as top cover like wildcard or something and it's doing or top level and it's doing everything else. 
and one of them gets and like it gets gets exposed or gets compromised and you have to do all of them intermediates kind of help mitigate that i didn't even think about putting intermediates in here i'm so sorry for that i didn't even like that's a great question and i might um yeah i'll, I'll maybe I'll, uh, I'll answer that later in a question um let's encrypt is the li is in the list of trusted ca default yes it is let's encrypt has has been um has been there for a while anyway let's go ahead I'm gonna. That's gonna be enough for questions. So, cert bot on Apache Ubuntu 20.04. Here we go. So, we're gonna SSH in as root at apache.agger.codes. And if we go back to my, if we go back here, we're gonna exit out of here, like uh, apache.agger.codes. Come on, you should be working. I did this yesterday. I think I might have misspelled it. I didn't misspell it though. I've had I had this weird problem with me yesterday. So system CTL status Apache two. It's running. Loud. Uh, let's go to my DNS. We're just gonna copy this. I don't know if I'm misspelling it. I don't know what I'm doing there. Maybe there's a space in front of it. I don't know. I keep doing that. Anyway, I have a non -sec I have a site. As you can see up here, this site is not secure. So we're going to go ahead and just use CertBot and secure the site. I've already installed CertBot. So the first thing that we would do is we would install CertBot, and then you install Apache 2, CertBot, and then you want to install Python 3-CertBot-Apache. And then I'm going to run CertBot double-Apache. So I can spell clear. CertBot double-Apache. And then basically it's going to ask us for email address, Sammy at DO.co. Um, I agree to the terms of service. Am I willing to let them email me? I get enough emails. Um, so, and then this is where I would put my name. So since this is apache.egger.codes, I'm going to put apache.egger.codes here. And now it's going to go ahead and it basically does a challenge, turns off my web server, does the thing, blah, 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 blah. Comes on and then uh, gets a certificate. Now it's going to ask me because it's going to write, automatically write all of my like my Apache configurations. So I'm going to say, do I want to redirect HTTP to HTTPS? Yes, I always select number two for this. You always want to do a redirect. Um, HTTP, if you don't do it, the browsers are about to do it for you. So now if I come back over here and I refresh the site, as you can see, we have secured our site. That was how simple it was to secure an Apache to a site with Apache. Um, now, if I remember correctly, then Etsy... Uh, dub, dub, dub. Apache 2. Uh, where does it? Sites available. So basically, it creates the sites available, sites enabled. Um, come on, what do we got? Zero, zero, zero. It creates. Man, this bell. Um, and basically, it just creates this. Adds this stuff, creates the sites available, sites enabled, so you can make them enabled, but you can also disable them. And then it just it tells us that it automatically writes all of this here. Um so now I okay, one second, because for some reason, that's not what I want. Where's my volume mixer? For some silly reason, Microsoft decided that they wanted to put a bell in my thing, and I do not like audible bells. Um, so people are asking about cron and stuff. Um, and what, what I didn't even know they had now is system CTL status cert bot dot timer. They've created a system CTL service to renew your cert bot cert for you, um, twice daily without you having to do the cron stuff now. So I don't even think you need to do the cron anymore. I think this just works. Like I found this in a digital ocean. It's amazing. I learned things from digital ocean tutorials. I've worked here. I've used the tutorials forever. I'm always finding stuff new. And as I was writing this presentation and double checking my work, I was like, I've never even seen this before. So now you have a system CTL service that automatically renews your certificate for you. So yeah, don't need cron for that anymore. Now let's go to the next one. Let's do this on Nginx. Let's do this with Nginx. So I have Nginx SSH root at nginx.egger.codes. I would probably also, also, uh, yeah, you're right. I run a double. Um, don't need it. And the same thing here. 
uh, with the Nginx one, it's literally the same as the Apache one. The only difference is, is that instead of installing, oh, see, I didn't even change my, ah, my slides are wrong. <laughs> Build gun, just gonna change that. Th that's how simple, that that's how uh, similar they were. I I didn't even bother to change the slides. So anyways, you install Nginx, cert bot. We've already done that. So I'm just going to do cert bot, double dash Nginx. I've already installed Python 3 dash. Uh, well, that's a Sammy at bo.co. I really hope we don't actually have someone at that email because they get all of these messages. Uh, and then we're just going to do Nginx.egger.codes. And ask us the same exact stuff. It's waiting on verification. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time. Yes, you do. Uh, I'm seeing a question here. Do do you? Uh, that's that's actually not the question I wanted to click on. Does Nginx and Apache work better for handling certificates? They're both really good at it. Personally, I prefer Nginx. Uh, it's a little bit less than Apache. Apache is like you know, the legacy, like very large, lots of tools and Nginx is a little bit smaller, a little bit lightweight. So I personally prefer that. Um, another question, can you use Let's Encrypt on a local dev web server? You have no need to. If you're local, you don't need to encrypt it. Um, and you need a valid domain. You cannot do it on an IP address. Um, so no, you won't be able to do it. Uh, can we try on CentOS? I didn't plan that. If I get, if I have time at the end, I will try it, but I can't guarantee you that I will have uh, time. <laughs> Because we're going to do a couple other things. Um, sent to us, it would be the exact same process, though. Install Nginx, install CertBot, install the whatever package that includes it. Python 3-CertBot-Nginx, probably. But maybe they named it something different. Um, and then you would run the exact same process. Nothing would change, except the fact that it's a different operating system. Um, there are tutorials on DigitalOcean's website uh, for doing this exact same thing on CentOS. So 100%, you can just look those up. So anyways, uh, now we go back to my web browser and we go to nginx.egger.codes. And as you can see, we have a secure connection. So the next one we're going to do is actually new, new to me. I've never actually worked with Caddy before. So Caddy is a new type of web server that's written in Golang that will automatically do this for you. So what we're going to do first is we actually do have to do a little bit more instructions because I did not set this up yet. Um, so we're going to exit out of this. SSH root at caddy.egger.codes. Okay. And now we're going to go back to this. I'm actually just going to pull this over here so I can just copy paste real quick. Um, so we have to do an apt install. We have to install the Debian archive key ring. Basically, we have to be able to add uh, some PPAs. So um, it will take a little bit, but it shouldn't be terrible. And now we're going to go ahead and add the GPG key. And we're basically curling it and downloading it. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, add the apt. And then we do apt update. Uh, did I make a boo-boo? Oh, I added a period there. Apt update. I hope I didn't break it because I don't know. I don't know enough about packaging to fix that. I used to be a CentOS person. I've never really gotten into a but like learning the okay, let's just try apt install caddy. Hopefully it's able to pull it from the right one. Because even though I have one that's wrong and one that's yeah. Okay. So now we have caddy. And it's creating a sim link there for us and getting it going. So if we go here and we go to caddy .codes. So now we have the caddy website. Now this is where I like I, I did this yesterday and I just I love it. It's great. Etsy caddy caddy file. So if we go to Vim Etsy caddy caddy file. So this is basically the file server. This is running a static site. Static site. So first off, just let's just take a little bit of time to appreciate 
how absolutely simple this is because I love it. It's amazing. But what's even cooler now is port 80 is what port it's running on. All I do is I come here and I say caddy.egger.codes. I save it and I restart the server. And now I come over to cat over back here and it's secure. Nothing else. Caddy handles the renewal. Caddy handles the server. I didn't have to, all I had to do, I take port 80. I put my, my, uh, my, my domain name in there. Boom. Immediate. This is, this is what like a lot of people refer to cat is like, this is a next generation, uh, web, web browser or sorry, web server. And yeah, this is it. Like really, it tells you right here, point your DNS records to this machine, upload your files, uh, Etsy caddy file. You, I would definitely, I didn't, we didn't make any custom HTML, but we could totally do that. Um, and then you just re well, reload. I did a restart and we're secure. And isn't that just neat? I love it. So I'm going to take the lack of comments as stunned silence or StreamYard's not bringing them into me yet. So that totally happens too sometimes. Okay. I have 15 minutes and I have one more demo to show you. So let's do something a little bit more, a uh, little bit more in depth. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about S load balancers and SSL termination. So encryption is expensive. And if you have your web server that is running your app also doing encryption and decryption, it very well could, um, it's, it could cause performance issues because they're a part of the CPU that's being dedicated to doing that when it could just be, you know, performing your web, like serving your web service. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to, I, I'm going to go ahead and what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand this up first and then I'm going to continue talking because this takes a little bit of time. Um, is I have a sample architecture that I've created that you I will also be able to get. I it's in the links in here. Um, Terraform apply. This is going to stand up that exact architecture that we saw. Um, if you haven't seen my Terraform talk, um, look on the DigitalOcean YouTube page. I have a Terraform talk that explains this entire thing. This is my building a minimal production stack on DigitalOcean. That's where this code is coming from. But basically what it's going to do is it's going to stand up th uh, three droplets and a bastion service. Uh, it's instead of a virtual private server, a load balancer. We're not going to do the database because I don't have time for the database. Um, and it doesn't, the database doesn't, uh, doesn't prove anything here. So we're not going to stand it up. Basically the load balancer for DigitalOcean is going to create our cert for us. And then we're going to get all of our traffic there. It's going to, it's going to do the decryption and then it's going to pass everything HTTP to the web. This is what's known as SSL termination. It's where you create a secure network and then you deal with the, de the SSL decryption at the, at basically at the DMZ at the edge layer, and then traffic gets passed in. So that way your web servers don't have to worry about it whatsoever. And the way that you accomplish this on digital ocean is when you're creating your load balancer say you're maybe making in the UI, if you port forward HTTPS from port 443 to port 80, you automatically get SSL termination. So um, this do.co slash TF dash sample dash arcs. Um, if you go to this site, this will take you to the GitHub site that has this exact code. Um, not the well, little bit less than exact because it will have the database. I modified it, but this exact uh, this exact stack you could stand up with one single command, um, and it's a really fun one that I love and I do enjoy. My um, I, I like Terraform. I'm a, I'm a big Terraform fan. So we're still creating it. Um, the load balancer is being created. We've created all of our droplets. We created firewall rules. So basically, you're not these web servers are not going to be accessible from the outside. Um, so they're only going to be talked across by their private IP address and nothing from the outside the VPC. The only thing that's going to get in is HTTPS traffic is going to come to the load balancer and get to the web. And then SSH traffic will come into the bastion and get to the, we're not even going to talk about the bastion, but I didn't take it out because it doesn't really, um, hurt it. Yes. So Cruz. Okay. While we're, we have a question right here. Uh, Cruz asks, so you only need to open port 80 on the web server if the load balancer terminates the SSL port 80. And I would also say port 22 if you want to SSH into it, but yes, you do not have to worry about port 443. You don't have to worry about it because again, like the load balancer will handle the HTTPS for us. We create a secure site and we don't want our web servers. Like if you're running like a flask app or something where it's having to actually use compute cycles, we don't want to waste a single compute cycle decrypting SSL certificates. Um, now 
there are other things you could configure a pass through where HTTPS just came right through and you did do that. It depends on you and how you want to architect your stuff. Um, there's a lot of different architectures. Uh, can we say that all local host connections are yes? If you're on your local machine and you're connecting to local host, it's safe. Okay, unless there's other unless your machine has already been compromised, and in that case, you have bigger problems. Um, but yeah, if you're doing local host, you don't got to worry about it. Um, if you watch my SSL talk, we you can look at like some SSL SSH tunneling. So, not SSL, SSH, my SSH talk, you can do some really cool tunneling things with SSH. Um, yes, this presentation is 100% already shared on the Tech Talk. It will go out in an email if you registered. Um, so if you just go to do.co slash tech talks, you will be able to find this presentation and it will be there. Um, are we done, Terraform? Terraform says we're done. So if we go to test.egger.codes, and hopefully it's still working. Come on. Do I have to go to HTTPS? Why are you no worky working? Let's look at our pod panel. I may have messed up my Terraform. Oh, they're still coming online, looks like. Come on. Aw. Make a boo-boo. Usually works. Okay, so that's working. So the non-secure version is working. Why is this not working? There it goes. Okay. It does it can take a little bit of time. Like these, this, like this, the process and stuff does take a little bit of time. Terraform says, so like, just always just give it a minute. But as you can see, um, I have five droplets. They each have a name, web, SFO, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, and the bastion's there, but the bastion doesn't count. Um, and as you can see, I'm load balanced. I get, they each have their, their, their host name on it. So as I refresh, we're host named through the HTTPS certificate is done. Um, everything's good. We're done. Like that's it now. And now you're, you never have to worry about managing your SSL cert. Now, most of you, like if you're doing like a single droplet, you may not need a load balancer, but if you want a little bit of redundancy, if you want to do some like blue green testing, because as you can see, um, I can totally like web balance SFO three to like half my users would get one half would get the other. Um, so someone says that's a lot of droplets and yes, I, uh, as one of the perks of working here, whenever I get to do these presentations, I don't have to pay for these droplets. You're right. Um, it's honestly my favorite part of the job. <laughs> I, I get to play with everything for free. So uh, yeah, that is, that's, that's load balancer SSL termination. I'm going to go ahead and destroy this because I don't want to leave. I, even though they're for free, I don't leave. You don't waste resources. I don't just leave stuff up. So while that's destroying, those are going to go away. That's done. That's done. Back to this. Um, okay. So SS. So and then there's the DigitalOcean app platform. So maybe you've done all this stuff on droplets, but maybe you know, maybe you don't want to manage your own web servers and stuff. Totally fine. If you haven't checked out DigitalOcean app platform, I highly recommend that you do it. You upload your code to GitHub. You commit it. It deploys. It's like magic. Um, I love it. It makes my life. As I get older, I get lazier. Like. I used to love managing servers and now I'm like, really? I need to manage these servers? I'm like, nah, I can do it somewhere else. SSL and TLS is automatically done for you by app platform. You don't even have to worry about it. Um, and if you want like a custom domain name, then basically you would just upload that custom domain name and then add a C name to your DNS records and you'd be done. And it just does it. And it's like, whoa, magic. And it's awesome and it's really cool tech. I really love it. Um, but as you can see here, you would like, uh, this is one of my app platform apps and I've added a custom domain here, discord.mason.dev. Um, if anyone's on Discord and wants to come and chat with me, that's my personal Discord server. That's open to anyone. It's where I talk about tech and stuff. Um, but I would add, I add that in and we're good. And as I said, as you saw from this presentation, like we had to type a couple commands to now we have to edit one file to the Terraform stuff's a little bit more complicated, but that's the, and now we barely have to do anything. Like you're right. It just keeps getting easier and easier and easier and easier and easier and easier. And it's pretty nice. And they like it. So that's my talk for today. We're doing pretty decently on time. I am going to try to answer a few questions really quickly, but there's a fun thing happening. As soon as I'm done with this talk, Cloud Chats is on.
which is the talk show, like a kind of like a personal talk show where if you want to come chat with me, you can. I have a special guest today. So on the DigitalOcean YouTube channel, we're going to have cloud chats. And after this, like literally at 11, it's 10.54 a.m. Central Time. So at 11 a.m. Central Time, myself and Matt Cowley are going to talk about the current cool things that are happening in tech, the current cool things that are happening in DigitalOcean. I highly recommend you come and talk about it. We're definitely, Matt's super awesome. You're really going to enjoy him. Um, what could be the reasons the site was showing insecure with search install when accessed through attached dynamic DNS link created? Uh, ooh, I don't know. I'm not understanding the question necessarily. It was, my site was unsecure because I went directly to the IP address and cell so, certs don't protect IP addresses. Um, and the, the load balancer thing, it just took a little bit. Um, magic voice in the sky. Did you drop the, yes, you did. Thank you. You were already ahead of me on that. Um, how do you create a name, a named SSL? Kind of like add your site's name before you lock, before the lock icon in the address bar. Is that the favicon? That might be the favicon. I don't know if there's anything about named SSL. I don't know how that works. I think that's a favicon icon. I don't. That sounds like a web design thing. That's. I don't think that if there if there is an icon before the lock in the bar, I don't think that's anything to do with SSL. I think that has to do with your favicon on your website. Um. The load balancer, load balancers basically are just a way to distribute traffic. And we use the load balancer to create the certificate and manage it for us and then do all the encryption decryption so we can leave the websites or the web servers uh, free to do the web server -y things. Do, does a load balancer automatically get SSL? Uh, you have to configure it in DigitalOcean to do it. Um, if you look at the Terraform code that I set up, it shows you how to do it. Uh, but it's very simple to do it on DigitalOcean. Like we, we've, we've made the process really nice. Is it okay to have TLS on localhost but ignore any security? Uh, if you want, you don't need TLS on localhost. I'll just tell you, it's not necessary. I would, you're like, like it's, uh, but yeah, you, you don't need it. It's not worth it. Uh, do, 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 do. Can you host your own self-hosted GitLab server to upload to app platform? Ooh, I don't know. That's a great question. I think we only support GitHub and Pro GitLab, but I don't know if we do self-hosted. That's a question I'm going to have to ask our product managers and I'll get back to you on that. Um, and yeah, if your load balancer fails, it will make sites, uh, inaccessible. Um, it depends on how you do it. If you like well, the website, the thing that we set up, we set it up where we don't want any public traffic coming to our sites, but you could do it. You could still allow public traffic in, um, if you wanted to, I, the, the the setup that we did, we cut that out because like the way for a VPC to be secure is for there to be no public traffic running in amongst it. So if a load balancer fails, yes, but that is, um, that's the case anywhere. If your load balancer fails on any other cloud provider, if your load balancer fails in your personal data center, you're going to have an outage. So yes, if a load balancer, if, if you're solely relying on that, then it is going to be a problem. How SSL can be done with managed Kubernetes clusters. There's custom Kubernetes things for that. I unfortunately didn't have time to go over those today. Um, but there's like custom Kubernetes plugins for that. Uh, and is SSL automatically renewed on a DigitalOcean droplet? Um, the cert bot timer should handle that, but you should double check. Uh, yeah, that's all I have for today. I do want to, I am trying to get up and run really quickly. So thank you. Please, please, please. Stay around. Come join us for Cloud Chats. It's going to be a fun time. I really hope you'll all jump over. It starts in two minutes, and we're just going to talk about fun stuff. Like, this was very technical and informative, but we're going to do fun things in a second. So I hope to see everyone there, and I will see you hopefully in about two minutes. Thanks, everyone.